Fantastic. All right. Thanks for hanging out until like the bitter end of Pi Ohio. It's, I know it's late and everyone's get home, so uh, got a lot of stuff to cover. So who am I? I'm Mike Griffith. Um, there's like stuff about me. I've been doing web development for a long time and uh, Python for about eight years. So I love Python um, and I love the web as well. So this talk is about single page applications, which um, a as you probably know, is more JavaScript than Python. So uh, being a Python conference, we've got to sneak some Python in here. So one of the things I love about Python is how expressive it is. So we're going to show you how you can quickly build a JSON-based API in about 25 lines of code with Flask, Flask SQL Alchemy, and uh, Flask Marshmallow. So what does it look like? For anybody who's been in any other of the web talks, I've seen a bunch of people already talking about SQL Alchemy. I'm hoping a bunch of you in the room are already familiar with it. Um, what we have here is a quick model that defines uh, a task or a to-do, because what we're going to be doing at the end of this is TDDing uh, the front end to it. So first what we've defined is uh, a SQL Alchemy model. So each task has an ID, a user that it's assigned to, a title, a description, and some sort of status. Uh, we also have this fun thing called a task schema. So Marshmallow is all about serializing stuff, and it's really good at it, and it has some built-in stuff for SQL Alchemy, which makes it great. So all we have to do is tell Marshmallow, hey, I've got this SQL Alchemy task. Here's my model. I've got the SQL Alchemy model called task. And then it'll figure out how to convert it to and from JSON, which is nice. Because then you can write some simple routes. Um, you know, if you're doing this in production and you're going to build a large API, you may want to look into something like Flask RESTful, which will do a lot of it. But for something simple where, in our case, what we're going to be using today is just getting a list of tasks out of a database and then updating a task, changing its status, assignee, stuff like that. Uh, we can do it pretty simply with just build in out of the box Flask. So we can say, if we want to get our list of tasks, we can say SQL Alchemy, filter all the tasks by the current sessions user ID, give them all to me, and then dump them out to response uh, according to how Marshmallow is going to serialize them. So you know, essentially three lines of code there, and we've got a JSON API that's serializing tasks out of the database. Similarly to update them, we can say, hey, SQL Alchemy, I've got this task that you told me. It's task five. Um, it's attached to this user. Uh, you've put some JSON up here. We're going to update all the fields that you've given me, replace it in the database, commit it, and then dump it back out. So that is a JSON API in 25 lines. So that's one of the beautiful things about Flask. Um, if you notice, in building that app, we're just talking JSON, right? So um, historically, building apps, we rendered a lot of HTML on the server. And in Flask, that means Jinja. Um, Django has their own templating language. At any other web framework, you know, you're putting a lot of HTML out. And uh, what I'm saying is these modern single page apps, uh, you're not going to do that at all. Um, so I'm going to be showing something called Angular. Um, is anybody in the room familiar with Angular at all? Okay, a couple people, so that's great. Um, Angular is a very controversial framework. It's uh, extremely opinionate, opinionated. Um, it really embraces the DOM and adds a bunch of stuff to it. And when you first look at it, you kind of want to puke because it looks like everything bad that we were told not to do, like click handlers in line, like all this weird stuff happening. Uh, mixing concerns, um, but it ends up allowing you to be incredibly productive if you're in its wheelhouse. And its wheelhouse is really about like dashboard-based or form-based uh, applications. If anybody ever used ASP.NET Web Forms, like the apps you would have built with that, you can do very efficiently in Angular. And my company ends up building a lot of these things for kind of enterprise customers, and we can rapidly prototype stuff, and it actually ends up being pretty great. The community for Angular is pretty awesome, too, like Python. So I don't, has anybody seen this picture before, the Gartner hype cycle? So for uh, any kind of technology, you kind of start out with like, hey, I want this technology. And you find something. It's like, oh, this is sweet. It's amazing. And then you realize, oh, god, it's not at all what I thought it was. And you kind of like, you go down to this trough of disillusionment where it's like, why have I just wasted the last however long? But eventually you realize there is something good about it. There, there's a reason there was some hype around it. Angular's got one, too, I made up. This is the Angular hype cycle. 
So you first, your technology triggers, hey, I want to do client-side apps. Like I want templates in the browser. I don't want to be Jinja. I want to be fast and you know, they tell me to do it. So you, d you do that. You see Angular's got this awesome dependency injection framework. So if you're like a real hardcore software engineer, like you, you, know, you read Bob Martin and you, you buy into DI and IOC and they've got it. Um, then you find this ng model thing, this two-way data binding, and it's like, whoa, there's all this magic happening. I just like put this thing here, and it shows up there, and it's amazing. And then there's this ng repeat thing that just like you decorate uh, an li HTML element and say, hey, repeat over all these JSON objects, and just does it for you, and subtracts them as needed. And Angular UI has like awesome components that like takes no you like zero lines of code, and you have all these like cool controls. But then you go back and you realize that thing you did with ng-repeat just caused your browser to crash because you forgot to track by ID and there's all these like weird edge cases. The Angular abstraction is awesome, but it's a very leaky abstraction. Like you quickly, under, you need to understand what it's doing and uh, you can't let it be magic for too long. So they also have this thing called a service provider and a factory. They're very specific things, but they all kind of do the same thing. Wap. Angular 2, there's a big controversy, even worse than the Python 3 thing. This directive definition our object is garbage. But there's ways to like corral it. John Papa has a style guide, and I'll post a link to the end to it. So, okay, that's enough code, or enough slides. What we're gonna do is we're gonna build a to-do app. So, we've got this basic application that can um, like show details for stuff, and you can start them and complete them. We're, we're gonna build this live. So I need to go back to my starting point, run my Flask development server, and, uh, oh geez, all this stuff's messed up. I was not expecting 640 by 480 here. So we're gonna start out pretty bare bones, and what we've, uh, what we've got to start is this kind of empty chunk, chunk of HTML that's rendered on the client. And we've got you know, a to-do, a doing, a done. Maybe a designer gave us this and say, hey, here's the basic structure. Well, we, so what we, we want to do is we're going to TDD this app into place. And I've started with a, uh, to get us started, a single failing test. What we're saying is, hey, visit localhost. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that there are five unassigned items, because that's what our database gives us for free by default. So we're going to run our test, and you're going to see a browser open. We're using the Protractor framework. It's based on Selenium. I don't know if anybody saw something happen, but like a browser window popped up. And, okay, zero doesn't equal five because we don't have any to-do. So what we got to do is we have to make there be five to-do. So what we are going to do is we're going to do that. And the first thing we're going to do is put a controller on our object because that's how we do things in Angular. So we're going to give this controller object and we're going to say uh, we want some to-dos listed out here. So we're going to use this thing called ng-repeat and we're going to say, hey, uh, all right, we want to make an li for every single to-do that we have attached to our controller. And we'll build our controller here in a minute. And then let's just see what they look like. So we'll serialize it to JSON here in the DOM. Uh, building a controller in Angular, uh, you kind of start with something called a module. So we build a to-do app module. I've got that already written here. And we need to build our controller. Um, our controller is going to need something called a to-do resource. And that's going to be the way we talk back to our API. So you just kind of ask for it and say, hey, my to-do controller wants a to-do resource. And Angular does something horrible to go figure out that it wants this at runtime. Um, it actually to strings your function and parses out your list of arguments and then goes and looks in this global registry. And that's fun. There's ways around it. Angular 2 is going to fix a lot of this stuff, but um, I have this habit of defining self as this in a JavaScript function. Anybody who's dealt with uh, closures and uh, yeah, you may understand why. But. So what we're going to do is we're going to query our API. We're going to say, hey, to-do resource, let's get all your stuff. And when you're done, I expect you to have given me some to-dos. And I'm just going to attach them to my controller instance. And with any luck, 
probably a bunch of syntax errors. Okay. Oh, that was a fun error. Uh, this ng repeat thing is, yeah, that's no fun. So, okay, hey, look, what we did here, uh, I don't know how to, where are you at? I was going to show you what's happening in the network view, but it's. Why would anyone need more than 640 by 480? Right. <laughs> well, I'm. I guess I can't show you the network view. Uh, what it did was Angular loaded this, I'm just going to close this. Angular loaded the page, um, saw that you had a controller bound to the DOM, and remember, we don't have like anything written out on the server side. Like literally, this is what we wrote from the server. It's essentially nothing. We said, we didn't write this live, I had this pre-canned. But hey, you're going to be a to-do app, and you're going to want to put some stuff in here. And then Angular took over, compiled the DOM, parsed it, walked the tree, found out that hey, um, you want this controller in place and instantiate an instance of the controller. The controller said, hey, I need a to-do resource. The to-do resource went out, queried your API, got it, stuffed it into JSON, and then data bound it, smashed in the API, and listed out that DOM. So we can get a little fancier in here, not too much. We'll get back to actually running our test here in a minute. But we're going to say, hey, let's put the title here. And the, I forget what I called it, description or details. So in theory now, we have to-dos. And with any luck, our test, if we get back to our protractor test, should run and pass and say, yes, you have listed out five to-dos. Hey, yay, it's green. <laughs> and I'm done. No, OK. Ah, where'd you go, Bim? OK, so um, that's great. Let's write another test. All right, so we were listing out the to-dos. Why don't we see if we can uh, show some details? How about that? Uh, why don't we click on the first uh, link we find in the unassigned column and expect to have uh, some details pane open. So we're going to have this dot details thing, and we're going to expect there to be no details to start. Then we're going to click a, the first link we find in the unassigned column, and we expect it to have opened the details pane. Does that make sense, that test is doing? So we're going to show that it's failing, because there is no link to click. OK, it's red, bad, error. Let's fix it. How do you fix it? Well. First, we need a link in here. Why don't we just make it click the title? So this goes back to all the things you were told never to do. We're going to put a click handler, handler right here in the line. We're going to say, hey, controller, show this to do when you click me. All right? And what the controller, wherever if I can find it, the controller now needs a show method. So we'll say, hey, uh, We'll bind this new function. Given some to do, <coughs> we're going to say uh, the selected to do is the one you just clicked on. We'll maintain the state of that selected to do on our controller instance. Then back in template land, we can say, hey, as long as this controller has a Selected to do, we'll show this div. That's what ngif does. It'll, it like literally rips it out of the DOM if that thing isn't there and puts it back in as necessary. And then you can use that thing. Down here, we can say, hey, put the title of the one that's selected here. Put the uh, description of it here. And put the status of that thing right there. So with that, where am I at? With any luck, as we click here, you'll see over on the right, can anybody see that? The details of the one we just clicked show up. By default, there's none. So who thinks the test is going to pass? I do. All right. <laughs> High five. Yes. <laughs> OK. It. Yeah, ship it. We're done. OK. Uh, another test. What about, well, we should hide the details, right? Because you show them. 
why don't we just hide them? Two. Because who wants the details up? What if you accidentally clicked or something? Okay. So let's let's click it. We'll expect it to have shown it. Then we're gonna what should we click? We'll click some button. How about that? We'll click a button that's in the details and expect the details to go back to hidden. So it won't be there anymore. Does that make sense? Okay. Run it. Sad face. Doesn't work. But we can pretty easily here um, decide how to fix that. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a button. Uh, do a bootstrap button. We'll uh, put another click handler in here because we love that. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're just going to rip that thing off the controller. So we'll say, hey, controller you're selected to do is now null whenever somebody clicks the close button. So they show it, then they close it. Show it, close it. You couldn't really see what was happening there because it's different than uh, this view where it's stacked. It kind of went into responsive mode because the window's so small, so the details were actually hidden at the bottom in the Selenium test, but it was actually doing it. So, yay! Why don't we actually start working on a to do? How about that? What would that look like? Uh, assign a to do to working. So, let's say. We're going to click a button now in the unassigned column. And once we click a button, we should have some, uh, a list now in the assigned column, one. So it would start at zero. We don't have any uh, items in our assigned column. We're going to click a button in the unassigned row and then expect there to be now an assigned item in there. Uh, failing test. Yay, okay, let's fix that. All right, we gotta put a button in here, right? So we're back in our to-do column. Uh, uh, what it means to assign it is essentially to change the status of a to-do in our data model. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, hey controller, change the status of this to-do to assigned, right? We'll say, hey, start. So now we'll have this button over here that says, start working. And we got to make it do something. Because our test is still, ah, oh, come on, Vim. All right, so we need that. Uh, no, what do we call it? Change status. So that's a new function on our controller. Uh, given some to-do and some new status, we need to update it. Well, our, uh, the REST API we built in Flask has a put method, right? And we have this cool thing called the to-do resource that has an update method on it, for those who can see it up here. So all we need to do is say, hey, to-do resource, go update the to-do with ID this to some new state. Um, oh, by the way, when you're done, call this thing. The new to-do state merely changes the status on a JSON object to what it is. So what's happening now is we're going to click start. It makes a put back to the server. It's updated the database, but it didn't do anything. It didn't refresh this magically. Um, if I was to refresh the page, you'd see, no? So maybe it didn't actually make. Let's see if I got it. Well, I can't watch my network tab, so. Maybe. Come on. Maybe, maybe. So there. Uh, ran a put and changed it to assigned. Okay, so that's great. So now we have these to do's and we have some of them that are assigned and some of them are unassigned. But right now what we're doing, if we look back at our to-do container, all we're doing is we're just iterating over all the to-dos. Well, that's not right. We just want to iterate over the to-dos that are assigned here, right? 
but our data structure from the server doesn't afford us that opportunity. But there's this magical library called uh, Lodash, you may have uh, heard of underscore, that gives all these awesome utility methods. One of them is group by. So we can say, hey, to do is why don't you group yourselves by your status? And it'll magically do this. I mean, there's a million different utilities in here for those. It's essentially jQuery for dealing with objects and stuff. Yeah. So um, now. Did you get a dot assigned on there from this that you just did? Okay, because uh, the question was, how did you get a dot assigned on it? If we go back and look at our server, we had this list of to dos that came back. One of the fields in there was status. Um, by default, it's just a list with a bunch of them. But if we say, hey, list, or I say underscore dot group by, group these to dos by the status field, uh, Lodash in this case will go through it and create a dictionary where the key is the status and the field is the list of objects that correspond to that status that have it. So it was that group by? It was the group by that did it magically. Yeah. And Lodash is different than underscore JS? It was a fork of underscore. Uh, they're reconciling their marriage, and I don't know, they'll figure it out, whatever. So all of a sudden, I don't have any to-dos in there. Why? Because right now I'm only showing the assigned ones. Um, what I meant to do was show the unassigned ones in that column. Let's make sure we fix that. So if we show the unassigned ones in the first column, we can copy-paste this huge mess of code, because copy-pasting is awesome. If we have time, the last step here is to refactor all this. Right now, I'm going to just duplicate this because it's the easiest, fastest thing to get our test working. So I'm going to show the unassigned in the first column and the assigned in the second column. And there we have it. Yay. We still don't have it completely working because you click Start, and it doesn't refresh itself until you refresh the page, which we don't want because it's a single-page app, right? So the way we'll solve that is uh, our initial query that kind of loads the to-dos and, and groups them, we're going to make uh, a function out of that. Uh, call it initially, and then also call it anytime something gets updated. So the first argument is what to update, the second argument is what to update it to, and the third argument is some callback. So we'll just pass and refresh as a callable. Now, with any luck, as we click start, stuff moves into that column. Uh, <coughs> tests. How am I doing on time? Five minutes? Five minutes? Yep. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, well, let's show our done. Well, we're supposed to TDD this. I don't have time to write my test. <laughs> Deadlines, man. Uh, so, it should move something to done. So, Start with none, click something from unassigned, click something from assigned, make sure we have something and done now. Uh, so to do that, we gotta do this, we gotta do our, you know, our, our group by is already working for statuses, so we can show the stuff and done. Um, the button in the middle was changing it to assigned, we need to change its status to done when you're in the middle column. We'll say, hey, that's completing it. Whoop. So now you start it, you do it, it's done. Remember that show details, that still works regardless where you are. Our test passes. <laughs> ah, go away. Uh, we'll do, what should we do? Try to refactor in the last 30 seconds or add another feature? Let's refactor, it's time. We haven't refactored. Um, what I want to do is something that Angular allows that's really neat called a directive. Uh, it allows you to make up arbitrary HTML elements, give them your name, pass stuff around to them, um, and like web components from Polymer or any of these other things, it kind of magically does it uh, at runtime. That's how all these things under the hood work for Angular. Like essentially everything's directive. It's turtles all the way down. Uh, so the, what we want to pass in is we want to say, Hey, to-do list, you're going to have some unassigned to-dos. Uh, you're going to have this show function. You're going to have this change status function. And your next status is the string 
assigned and your next status label is start. And then we want to make that and we essentially want to turn this into a repeatable chunk so that we can have the to-do list be all that boilerplate that we had that was copied in each one of those. So what we do is we make a new partial, our to-do list. Some boilerplate. We can repeat over the scope variables we're going to pass into it. Uh, use the additional <coughs> things we abstracted out. Are you sure you didn't use underscores? I used hyphens. And Angular does something amazing with hyphens, is that it turns the hyphenated case into lower camel case for you at runtime. Makes it nearly impossible to debug anything. And uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. I, I kind of have to gloss over a lot of these details. So I don't, yeah, pretend that's all. There's a lot of magic happening here. And w I mean, that's one of the things, like once you um, learn how to use Angular and you learn these little tricks, I mean, you can do stuff amazingly fast. So remember we did to do hyphen list, we do uh, upper camel case to-do list here, which gets converted at runtime as well. So we have this amazing thing called the directive definition object that we return from our function. And it has a scope thing that's horrible. And you say, hey, you wanted to pass me some to-dos. Well, I'm going to two-way data bind it. That's what that equal sign is. And you wanted to pass me this next status. And that's an attribute label, or you can, yeah. Uh -uh. I don't remember what else I passed. Anybody? It was a yeah. And a change status. So we're going to say, hey, that's the stuff you want to be passed along, in this case, as attributes. And I want you to render the template at URL. One minute? OK. Remember, we had all these tests. So now we can refactor with confidence. We can run this and find that our tests are broken, which is awesome. <laughs> the directive name to-do list is invalid. The first one must be a lowercase. Oh, thanks, Angular. So we do that. Forget checking it. Let's just run our tests. <coughs> no? Almost. Da -da -da -da. Oh, because it couldn't find. The unassigned button. And why? To do list should assign a to do to working. So that button doesn't work anymore. So it's great that our test is showing it. That's how we can refactor with confidence now that we've test driven all this. Because we missed the binding on that. Now. handful of other slides here. Where are they? References. Torin Billups did a talk using Ember, doing something very similar that was amazing. If you guys are into TDD, that's a good one to watch. Um, the, the Flask app is pretty much garbage and not production ready, even though it's only 25 lines, it's fun. Uh, Cookie Cutter Flask is amazing if you guys want to do uh, Flask projects. Uh, John Papa's Angular Style Guide, Protractor, which we use for our testing, and that's it. Thanks, guys.